Hello there guys, what is going on? Daniel Childs back here again for another show and we enter the mad carousel of Chelsea head coaches or potential Chelsea head coaches again and I wanted to start start getting some expertise on potential candidates and one of those names that has been mentioned not just in the past couple of days but also for many months now is Sporting Lisbon's Ruben Amrim and I'm very glad to say we have got a Portuguese football expert from the Long Ball Football Podcast Albert, how you doing, mate? Thank you so much for coming on the show to speak about Amrim. Absolutely my pleasure. Um, happy to be here. Always happy to talk about Ruben Amrim. He's one of the stars of Portuguese football. So any excuse, um, yeah, I'm happy to. So yeah, great to be here. Absolutely. I, I wonder if you've had several people get you on to talk about him as a potential candidate because I know there's so many clubs this summer looking for... I, I know Liverpool were linked to him, weren't they, a few months ago? Yeah, exactly. We never actually chatted to anyone about Liverpool because that whole situation seemed to kind of open and close quite quickly. That was a weird time. Maybe we'll come on to talk about that a bit more because obviously Amarin made that trip to to the UK to, I mean, at the time we thought it was to chat to Liverpool, then it might be to chat to West Ham. And then actually there was a small um, suggestion that it was Chelsea that had paid for him to go over. So it was a, a strange time. But yeah, it looks like it won't be Liverpool that he's going to. Obviously it won't be West Ham, but... Chelsea are still there with uh, with with interest allegedly so yeah exciting in terms of the reaction to him being linked with Chelsea because it's not just since Pochettino has left it's it has been a name that has been linked with the club for many months it is is it something of a surprise or are you know from some vantage point of watching this coach for a long period of time it, this is kind of just expected given his his success yeah not a surprise at all I mean he's he's earned all this speculation I mean um I guess the only question has been where would he end up and England has always been a strong uh, a strong candidate he doesn't really have any playing roots in other countries you know sometimes Portuguese managers might have um, a playing career in Spain or Italy or somewhere like that which might see them linked with clubs in the league or Serie A or, or whatever but Amrim only really ever played in Portugal he's only ever managed in Portugal but um, England has always been yeah, strong candidate, Manchester United, Chelsea, uh, Liverpool, West Ham. There's been there's been a lot of links, but um, from our side, it's not a surprise at all, really, the kind of calibre of club that he's been linked with because he's been a standout manager in the league for, for quite a few years now. Um, his trajectory has, trajectory has been uh, astronomic in some senses. So, yeah, he, he, he looks like the next Portuguese manager destined for... For, for big things. In terms of uh, Sporting Lisbon, I mean, I can only speak from someone who's watched the odd video about him, read the odd article, spoken to people, you know, who were either Portuguese Chelsea fans or people who live in Portugal who know him. And, and all they say and talk about really when I asked them is, is really about the, the significant and historical impact he's had on Sporting Lisbon. So for some, some of us who only know a brief history of Portuguese football we we'll only see them in the Champions League when we face Porto or Benfica or Lisbon um, how significant has the impact he has had on that club um, very significant I mean if you like I can give you a sort of brief rundown of his place in Portuguese football really I mean obviously he's, he started as a player he played uh, the vast majority of his career in Portugal actually he played the vast majority of his career for, for Benfica but as a player he was never quite that top top level of player he did play for the national team he played 14 games for the national team he went to I believe he went to two national uh, two major tournaments with Portugal um, but again he was never that player who was starting every game he was never the kind of the key man at, ben at Benfica it was almost a similar situation as well he did play quite a few years there but he um, he didn't have very many seasons where he was a key part of a, of a starting 11 um, at Benfica although fair to say that he was um, his, he, his was a career hampered by, by injuries but um, he retired at 32 years old which is quite young in itself and by that point he'd actually not played football for about over a year apparently so his his playing career was um not perhaps what it could have been um but i think we've seen that with quite a few uh promising managers in the modern era where their playing career isn't quite at the top level when maybe they have a, a lot of time to think about tactics and stuff he got into coaching pretty much as soon as he retired, you know, he, he took his coaching badges on. Um, his first club was a, a small club in Portugal, a team called Casapia. Um, they do actually play in the Premier League and now they play in the top division, but at the time they were a third division club. And in Portugal, the third division is 
significantly smaller than what the third division in England is as a, as a comparison. So this was quite a small club and he was there for, for quite a small amount of time. But clearly because of his, his playing days and his connections, he, he had a kind of reputation because he did then get a good job at um, the Braga under-23 team. Very interestingly, he was actually offered the same position at Benfica, at the club that he paid played for and that you might feel he has a natural connection with, but didn't take it. Um, took the, the the position at Braga, did very well Braga under 23s. Uh, they do actually play in the league system. They played at the same level as Casapia, the third division. He did pretty well there. I think he played something like, um, he managed, excuse me, something like 11 games, won eight of them. There's not a lot of info about his time at Casapia. Um, but he did uh, pretty well at Casapia, did very well at Braga under 23s. And then after a few, a uh, couple of months at Braga under 23s, takes over the senior team. That's where his career starts to really take off. He joins Braga in the December. They're in eighth place. By the end of the season, they're in third. They've qualified for the Europa League. They've won a domestic cup. Um, and Sporting pay 10 million euros to make him their first team coach. Um, I think it's quite important to stress that 10 million euro fee. For English football fans, 10 million euros might not seem like a lot of money. At the time, he was the third most expensive manager in the history of football, which is crazy, considering that that was paid for by a Portuguese club to another Portuguese club. For context, um, only recently the domestic transfer fee was broken in Portugal. Uh, Porto paid 20 million euros to a player from Braga. Portuguese clubs do not spend a lot of money in general, but to pay that to another Portuguese club was huge. And actually at the time, sporting fans were pretty angry about it or well somewhere to be fair they had a uh, a president in Federico Veranda who was a little bit unpopular perhaps had been seen as a bit reckless with money and so they paid 10 million euros for a manager who'd only managed for two months excuse me not two months he'd only managed for a few months in the top flight uh, less than a full season it was seen as quite reckless but obviously it would go on to be most important decision that uh, Verandas made and and uh, changed the modern history of sporting. You know, he, what Amram has achieved at sporting is the best uh, achievements they've had in the last 25 years at the club. He, he won the league in his first season in charge. Um, he followed that winning season up with another season where he got the same amount of points as when they won the league. They were beaten by Porto, who got 91 points in the league, which was a really great achievement. The third season was a bit of a transition season, but then, of course, it brings us to this season where they've been um, the best team in Portugal. They they won the league with 90 points. Um, comfortably, for me, the best team we've seen in Portugal in, in quite a few years. You know, In Portugal, the days are kind of over of these like Jose Mourinho's Porto, for example, a team good enough to win the Champions League. Those days are over, sadly. But um, in the modern history of the Premier League, it's one of the best teams um, we've seen. And, and his they're going to play in the, the equivalent of the FA Cup final tonight. They've got a chance to do a double, which they haven't done in 22 years. Um, and really, all of that stems from Amarim's appointment as uh, as manager and the changes that he's brought into the club and of course credit where it's due to the to the president and the administration because yeah the last five years for sporting uh, with Ruben Amarim in charge have been have been incredible it's been more than what most sporting fans could have dreamed of and and to bring them back to the very top of Portuguese football where like I said for 20 years it was just Benfica and Porto it's um, an incredible achievement so yeah he's his achievements uh, are vast uh, to say the least. Uh, we'll get into sort of like the tactical side because I know there's been a lot of interest and um, I guess theory over how Amram's football could translate to the Premier League. But in terms of his character and I guess connecting with fans, I mean, that's the interesting thing historically, right? Like we've just had this with Pochettino, someone who did very well with a bit of rival of Chelsea and there was a friction because Chelsea fans couldn't really open themselves up to the, some Chelsea fans couldn't open themselves up to the fact that there was a Spurs coach at the club and you, you, you know, you're talking about someone who played for Benfica, bit of rivals of Sporting Lisbon and he's become one of their most iconic and, and probably now beloved coaches. I mean, t to do that, you must have great communication skills. You must have a good character. Is that something that really stands out with Amrim in, in regards to the fans? It, yeah, it definitely does. And actually the, the the situation with Sporting Benfica is quite an interesting one. I've asked Benfica fans about this, about how they feel about... Because ben, Benfica have had good seasons, but they've also... I think they've only won the league once in the last five years, which is not, not amazing. So I kind of have asked them whether they feel, looking at Sporting, that Amrim is someone who they... they 
let get away. And like I said, they did offer him a position in their coaching staff, which he turned down. It's an interesting one because I think actually Amarum's relationship with Benfica wasn't that great. And that was to do with the fact that he, he was never really given loads of opportunities and he was given a lot of chances and he stayed there for a long time, but it wasn't like he was a club legend, shall we say. So I don't think the fans necessarily looked at Amarum, Benfica fans looked at Amarum and saw him as some kind of talismanic club legend that they wanted. And sporting, I think for sporting fans in a weird way, perhaps it almost worked for them because they felt like they'd, taken something from their rivals in that sense so mm. maybe in that way it kind of helped but um he yeah he's always had a good uh a good relationship with the fans he's a good communicator he's a young manager you know he's still he's still in his 30s so he he's never going to be this kind of authoritarian figure at the top of the club he he relates to the players he relates to the fans so in that sense yeah he's definitely more along those lines than a kind of uh, figurehead of a club who's going to be almost um, untouchable, if that makes sense. He he is a, a relatable character, and obviously, he um, will will need to be a disciplinarian when needed, and all that kind of stuff. But in general, yeah, I would put him much more on that side of a relatable manager and a kind of um, someone that the that will want to connect with the players and the fans, definitely. Moving on to the, the tactical side, obviously a lot has been made about how attack-minded his team is at Lisbon, especially this season, kind of looking at this 3-4-3, three, three, very fluid style. But there has been some criticisms or concerns about how this very offensive style would work against a higher calibre of opposition. I mean, from your... Is that unfair? Is it? Is it a, is it a, coming from a perspective of people who don't watch... Portuguese football that regularly sort of dumbing down the quality of the league or, or do you think there is some valid concern there in terms of what Amrin would face at a Premier League? Um, it's it's. I think it's more about context. I think what people need to understand is that um, Sporting play 34 games a season in the Premier League. They only really play six games against other teams that can match them out of that 34. So when you talk about a team playing attacking football, they're really going to, they have to play attacking football the vast majority of the time because they are the team with the, the better players on the pitch the vast majority of the time. And so, you know, they do play a kind of, so they play a 3 4 3, but the, the, the wing backs, whatever you want to call them, they play very high. You know, they play, they play like, um, like wingers basically and, they can obviously do that in the vast majority of games because the other teams can't handle the quality of players that they've got. Um, against uh, kind of the bigger teams in Portugal, that is something that I've been kind of interested to to watch because those are always crucial games, like I said, because they happen so rarely. And um, I think back to recent games, even this season against Porto, where um, actually the game after Amarim returned from that trip to the UK, um, and he was a little bit uh, flustered. Perhaps he knew he'd made a mistake, and he went into a game against Porto, and he and he switched up the team, and he put uh, more defensive players on the wings, and it didn't quite work. Um, so in that sense, that was a time when I kind of thought maybe he struggles to set up his team against um, fellow big clubs. But with that said, his record against other good clubs is actually pretty good. You know, I wouldn't say it's spectacular. I wouldn't say it's terrible. In the league, he's got. A, perfectly good record against the big clubs. I wouldn't say it's a particular failing. Um, I would say that in my personal opinion, if I if I ever have a slight reservation about Amarim, it's that I think it's taken him a bit too long to to perhaps have the self-belief that in a game like that, he should really be telling setting his team out to, to dominate a game, to put their mark on a game rather than reacting to the other team. I think he has perhaps in the past had a tendency um, not just domestically against Porto Benfica, but also perhaps in uh, European football, maybe had a tendency to look at these other clubs on, on his level or above Sporting's level and try to match them, react to them when actually this season, especially they've they've had the squad to to take their own game to, to other mm -hmm. teams. I don't necessarily think that that's a major issue though I don't f look at that as a permanent character flaw in any way I think it's just something that he's working out because you know he is still a young manager and he, and he is still learning and, and in some ways Portugal is a, a good place to learn but that perhaps lack of uh, competition at, at the top level means it's slightly harder to learn how to adapt against other big teams but I don't yeah personally I don't see that as a huge character flaw and I, I do back him to 
to always learn and I think what he's shown throughout his career is that at every stage of his career he's adapted and he has um, overcome obstacles uh, whenever faced so yeah in that sense I wouldn't worry too much it's it's obviously a huge jump and I think that at the moment there's a lot of Chelsea fans who are cautious I, I think more so on the ownership side and the, the the culture of the club side than maybe even the the flaws and the strengths of the coaches we're talking about you know, on that and their own, you know, how would they fit in at Chelsea? What is the expectation level? How are they going to interact with the sporting directors and hierarchy, which clearly was an issue with Mauricio Pochettino and, and Thomas Tuchel. I, I just wonder whether you think Amrim is ready to make this jump because it is such a leap in, I mean, again, I, I, I fear that I sometimes sound like I'm being disrespectful to the size and scale of Sporting Lisbon, but obviously the interest in the Premier League is is so high and the scrutiny that a Chelsea coach comes you know is under on a regular basis and just the culture so it's not just I guess a tactical thing is it it's also like a, a personality and political thing so there's a yeah there's a few there's a few ways to look at that in a sense of is he ready to to leave I would say there's nothing more that he can do in Portugal in that sense um, he's taken sporting as far as he can, both domestically and possibly in Europe, although maybe getting to the slightly more latter stages of perhaps a Europa League would be the next thing that he could do at sporting. But in some senses, I think he's pretty much taken as much as he can out of his time in Portugal. So in that sense, I think he's ready to leave. But in terms of those other, other aspects, um, the pressure type, that type of question. Um, I think it is important to recognise that there is a lot of pressure in Portugal, um, and especially for someone like Amarim, who has, like I said, only ever really managed and played in Portugal. Um, don't uh, fall into the assumption that playing and managing, uh, sorry, excuse me, managing sporting wouldn't come with pressure, and, and he wouldn't feel that pressure. I think he certainly would. And he played for Benfica, the team with the most pressure in the league, without without any doubt. So he has dealt with pressure and expectation um, for a lot of his career, although I think sporting was perhaps, you know, he went in there when expectations were very low. So he did he did, uh, he did, did benefit from that. The one thing that is going to be a big, big difference for Amarim will be going from working under probably a slightly smaller administration, but crucially an administration where essentially the whole club was built around him. Like they they knew the system that he wanted to play and every single player that was brought in was for that system and for the benefit of the team. Um, you guys will obviously know a lot more about Chelsea than me, but from the outside looking in, it does seem like there are perhaps um, lots of signings being made uh, and perhaps if Amarim was to go into Chelsea, it would be a slightly new situation where he would be given players essentially and asked to work with them in a way that he's not at sporting at the moment like i said at sporting right now every single person in the in the building is working towards amarim's favorite system and his favorite types of players in all the scouts all, all the uh, administration everyone so that could be an interesting dynamic definitely and that is something where i don't really have anything to base it off because yeah. he's not had that situation to to deal with in portugal um, if I'm thinking about ways that I could judge how he would deal with that, I mean, he 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 is a young coach. I think he is adaptable. He, you know, you look at Sporting, and I think that is probably the one red flag for talking about him moving to Chelsea, is that he has played one system the entire time he's coached. He's always had the players bought for him. What would happen if he was put into a situation where that wasn't the case? How would he respond? We don't really have anything to go off other than the fact that mm. he's a young manager, so hopefully he's adaptable. Um, he's already would have played in in different in different systems as, as a player and um, this seems to be his preferred way of playing as a manager. Could he adapt? I would hope so, but yeah, we don't really have a lot to to go off with that question unfortunately i think that's the problem with a lot of the candidates to be honest i mean maybe the exception of of roberto de zerbi who hasn't been ruled out yet you know enzo maresca has only just got into kind of senior head coach himself you know uh kieran mckenna you know has a little bit more but like 
has has coached mainly at Ipswich now. Obviously, was in the it was more youth coaching and then made that step up, but hasn't coached in the Premier League yet. So it's it, it, this is the issue with the candidates Chelsea are going for is it's not you know Pochettino had a lot of experience in his career, and I think that's the there is going to be a leap of faith whoever they appoint here, and I think that that's it's such I agree with you that it is such a Chelsea is such a unique beast in that sense, and especially this version of Chelsea is is such like that that. It is, of course, a different thing where, you know, a lot of coaches who are successful, and this is maybe a broader discussion um, in terms of whether Chelsea are actually prioritising how they view a head coach in the right way, because, you know, it feels like Arteta, Pep, Klopp, you know, these are coaches who things are built around them and, and for them rather than just you're just a coach. But it seems like Chelsea are going in the opposite direction. So it, it will be curious. Just one final question, because Chelsea, obviously, now we know that Chelsea are going to get Europa Conference League. I mean... In terms of Europe, that's that's a, a competition now that Chelsea fans, myself included, feel like there's a, a really good chance to win next year. I mean, for him personally, how unique of an opportunity could that be in his in his debut season at Chelsea if he does become the new head coach? Totally unique. I mean, that's that's one thing that he's never had is an opportunity to play in a European competition where his team had uh, a real possibility of getting to the latter stages. His his history in Europe is pretty good, actually. He did two seasons in the Champions League with Sporting. Only got out of the group once, but I mean, for a team of sporting size, that's fine, you know, a fine achievement. And in the Europa League, um, he got to the round of 16 and actually got to the quarterfinals once. Both times he was knocked out by, well, he was knocked out by Juventus once and Atalanta this year. Atalanta at the time seemed like a bit of a missed opportunity, but obviously they did go on to win it, so maybe that slightly softens the blow now. But yeah, he's never he's obviously never managed in the Europa Conference League because Sporting have always qualified for higher competitions. Um, so yeah, totally unique opportunity for him in that sense. And, and I can see why that would almost be an exciting opportunity for him because yeah, he's never played in European competition where his team have been the favourites in every game that they've gone into, which I imagine would be the case if he was to manage Chelsea in the Conference League. Um, He's done well with the domestic cups in that situation. So Sporting being cup competition in Portugal, where they were the favourites every game, he's done pretty well. Um, he's won a few cups and they're in the final, like I said tonight. So um, in that sense, he's 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 done that before. But Europe will be different and quite exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, mate, for for coming on the show. Uh, as I do with all my guests, just a chance for you to to shout out where people can find your work, your podcast uh, regarding uh, Portuguese football and. You know, whether Amram comes or not, I'm, I'm sure people will be interested to, to hear about it. Yeah, absolutely. So it's the Long Ball Football Podcast. We're on Twitter, um, at Long Ball Football. Um, Portugal is a great league to follow if you're interested in European football. It's slightly outside of the top five leagues. So um, you still get the great players. You still get the great managers like Amram. Um, you get a little bit of like chaos as well, which is kind of fun. Um, but it's a, it's a great league to follow and it's a great time to check out the show as well actually because uh, we've just released a full end of season review so if you haven't kept up with the Portuguese league you can listen to that and find out how all the teams did including Sporting and Benfica and who the best players are who the managers are and all that kind of stuff so, uh, so yeah check it out absolutely links will be in the description box below thank you guys so much for watching and listening follow me across the socials at Son of Chelsea and I will see you again very soon all the best